Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible, Bible Talk. Talk. Yay! Yeah, and on behalf of Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we are here, ready to do the next episode in what we started on our last week, which is the evidence of a redeemed life. Here, by the way, is out in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean, aboard the uh, Navigator of the Seas. You can hear it squeaking. You can, so if you hear the squeaks and the groans and the moans, like I said, that's not us. That's no, the that's ship. Us. That's us. We're doing better than the ship. Hallelujah. We are rejoicing. We yeah. don't want to moan. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, we started in our last program. We've been doing this in search of Christianity for over a year and a half. And the concept was, you know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? It's like he'll be looking for that faith. Faith that arises in our hearts from what he has said. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. And tell them where fear comes from. By the way, since Alice mentioned it, yes. fear comes by hearing. Hearing the world. David said in Psalm 55 that when he listened to the voice of his enemy, he became distressed and fear built up in him. So you see, we like a radio, you, you can tune in what you're going to listen to. And Jesus said, be careful what you listen to. So you will either choose to listen to him, his word, or you will listen to the world. One will build faith that will give you victory in life. One will give you fear, which will defeat you in life. Either the word or the world. There's an L of a difference. Okay. So, based on that, what we're doing now is we've been, we've been looking for those things that demonstrate what true Christianity is. And we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount. For, we did a Sermon on the Mount study for well over a year. The second one we've done a couple of years back, we did another one for over a year. Because that is, by my definition, and I pray, if you pray about it, you'll find that it's by your definition. That was when Jesus took his disciples in the very beginning and taught them, trained them, before he sent them out as the light of the world and the salt of the earth, to go out into the world. You know, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and he said that, that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for training in righteousness. So the Sermon on the Mount was his training in righteousness. Everything before that kind of leads up to the Sermon on the Mount, Everything after that is kind of commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, if, if you look at it, right? So what we're doing is rather than looking out at the, at the church or the world to see whether that lines up with what we think of as Christianity, this particular study that we started last week is a look in the mirror, to look at ourselves and examine ourselves and see if we bear the evidence of a redeemed life. And thus the name of the study, The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. So in the introduction, we were talking about, in general, the things, you know, there's, it's, it's either you're going to be ruled by the deeds of the flesh, or you're going to be ruled by the, and led by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're starting now, is looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I said last week that, you know, men, people in the world, they can't see your spirit. That's why God spoke to the prophet, or to the prophet Samuel, and said, you know, man judges by outward appearance. God searches the heart. So he's looking in, a, in our heart. What's he going to look for in our heart? Well, he's written his word on the tablets of our heart, and he's poured his love into our hearts through his Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Romans 5, 5, right? right. So what he's looking for is his love and his word. That's what he's looking for. And love is the first of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that begins the true evidence of redemption in your life. I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, a lot of people, and we talked about this a lot, so I don't want to rehash it too much. But a lot of people think, well, I can tell you're a Christian by the way you dress. I can tell you're a Christian by how much you tithe. I can tell you're a Christian. No. It's, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Okay? So while they can't see your heart, they can see what comes out of your heart. They can see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you. Hopefully they can see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you. So everything gets tested by the Word of God. That's the test. That's the only rule. It doesn't matter if you like the way I look. It doesn't matter 
you know, we're sitting here, we're on board the, the ship, as I said, and we're sailing from England back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I said this, and I've said this in love, so I want to whisper this. We have a lot of British friends. We spend, we base ourselves for more than half the year in England. They talk funny over there. <laughs> they can't even tell the difference between an elevator and a lift. <laughs> okay, but that's another story. So today we're joined by a dear sister from South Africa. Hallelujah. Who lives in Glasgow. Now, you want to talk about talking different than us. <laughs> Take your choice. And, you know, we, we have some, a dear brother, a dear family in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa that we're actually working with now because they've started an internet radio station down there, and we're going to be broadcasting through that radio station. And he moved from Manchester, England, down to South Africa about a, I guess about a year, a year, a year and a half ago. Yeah. They, they moved there with six children and then had their seventh while they were there. Living by so faith, seven. truly living by Absolutely faith. Absolutely living yeah. by faith. So, you know, the, the idea is that you examine things based on the Word of God. And we talked about how Jesus was tested tested and tempted. Mm, yes. It doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter how I sound. It doesn't matter whether I have a New York accent or I, you know, what matters is, is the word of God, what's coming out of my mouth. So let me do this. Father, I pray that nothing but your word would come out of my mouth during the study, Lord God. That nothing would come out of my mouth that you didn't put in my heart, Lord God. That you'd put a guard over my mouth. Lord, that you would use Alice and I just to be an encouragement and a blessing to those people who love you and love your law, Lord God, your word. So we just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. So, if you're going to do an investigation, and this isn't a hard thing, I mean, it's an examination. And the word says clearly, you know, we're to examine ourselves. The things you should be seeking to find is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Did you ever, I know, I, I, how many of you here know, have heard of the fruit of the Holy Spirit before? Sure. But have you thought about that last line of Paul's there? Against such things, there is no law. Now, I want to tell you something. The world, if it could make laws against the fruit of the Holy Spirit, they would, without doubt. But this is the inspired Word of God. He says, there is no law against such a thing. And I have to share a little personal story with you. We like those. We like those. Uh, I, I was raised Catholic, and I went through Catholic school all, all through my youth up until through my high school, which is a, a university prep school mm -hmm. for a boys' school run by the Irish Christian Brothers. Mm -hmm. Dear men, they were who inspired fear in my life. That's another story. Okay. <laughs> um, but I really hadn't heard the gospel. I, hadn't, I didn't know the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I think the very first time that I encountered the gospel, now remember God... The disciples wondered about Jesus. Why do you always speak to people through parables? And remember, you know, parables are not, not the word. They are things that God showed to teach about the word. I believe, I, I lived in New York City. I grew up in hotels. My dad was in the hotel business in New York, in Manhattan. So I had tickets to the grand opening of a movie in New York, I think I was about 14 years old. It must have been about 1957. The name of the movie was Ben-Hur. Anybody here familiar with the movie Ben-Hur? Yeah? Not the new one by any means. The one that had as a true title what General Lew Wallace wrote in the book. Ben-Hur, A Story of the Christ. So anyhow, I went to see this. And as I say, I was 14 years old. I had, I, I had no religious inclinations in my life that I knew of. But there was a scene, and I want to share this scene with you. If you remember, Ben-Hur had been sentenced to the galleys, to go roll in the galleys, which was basically a death sentence in, in the Roman world. And they were taking, the Roman soldiers, led by a centurion, were taking him and other prisoners to these galleys, which were a death sentence. And they got to a little village, which happened to be Nazareth. And 
because this centurion had taken an instant hatred to, to Ben Hur, he the first thing they did was they watered because it was a terrible suffering journey. They watered their horses. The Romans watered their horses first. And after their horses were watered, they said, okay, give some water to the prisoners. But the centurion said, not to him, not to Ben Hur. And Ben Hur, oh, Ben Hur, they showed a close up of Charlton Heston playing him. He was down on his face on the earth. And he cried out, Oh God, help. And a, and a shadow falls upon him. And a man, now throughout that entire movie, one of the things I like, they never show the face of Jesus Christ. But you know this is Jesus Christ. And he takes a ladle and he goes over and gets water and he bends down and he's giving water to Ben Hur. And the centurion comes over. Now remember, centurions, Roman centurions in this time, in this, they were the law. They were the power of the world. And the centurion hollers at, at obviously, Jesus and says, I said no water for him. And all you see is a shot from the back that Jesus Christ lifts his head up and looks into the eyes of the centurion. And the centurion just backs off. Backs off. Expressions. And that yeah. was the first time that I saw and recognized the power of God. Mm. But you know what that power was? It was the power of love. Mm. There is no law against love. The centurion couldn't stop the love of God. The devil can't stop the love of God. Mm. The world can't stop the love of God. Mm. The law cannot stop the fruit of of the Holy Spirit, the, can't stop the Holy Spirit from working in your life. Never, never, never let man, or the laws of man, or the or those spirits of, that are against God, never let them stop you from moving in the Spirit and the love of God. Okay. Love. Every time I think of that, I mean, that was the first time I heard the gospel. It, it changed. It changed me. It was a seed that was planted that bore fruit years later. Okay, stop it. Okay. So we're going to start the fruit of the Holy Spirit because Paul starts with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, with love. Okay. Therefore, thus says the Lord God: Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Our God is love. Jesus Christ on the cross is the demonstration, the proclamation of God the Father's love. Isn't that clear? Nothing could stop that. Why do we have Bible studies? Why do we get in the why do we get in the word? I mean, you know, I did I studied I did graduate work in a seminary in theology. God protected me. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the, the scripture says so simply, the goal of our instruction is love. That's what it says in Paul's letter, first letter to Timothy. The reason we get into the word is to know him better because he is love. So we grow, in, in, first of all, in our love for him, in our understanding of his love for us, so that we might love others. Okay? That's it. Now... I said this about Christianity. If you're going to go search for Christianity, you better know what it is. So now if you're going to look for love in your life, you better know what it is. I, I know a song. It's just, uh, in 1955, when I was a teenager, a young teenager, I was a kid. I was just a little kid. <laughs> there was a song, Love is a Many Splendored Thing. I don't know if you ever heard that song. Want me to sing it for you? No, you don't. <laughs> It was written by Sammy Fain and Paul Webster. And that may be as specific a definition as the world can give you of what love is. It's a many splendor thing. And they write thousands and millions of songs about love and don't have a clue what it is. They make movies about it and tele shows, television shows, too long in England, television shows, and still they really don't understand what love is. So what we need to do is to understand what love is and we're going to look for it. So... From all of the evidence around us, the one thing that has to be evident, the thing that the enemy wants people to believe and has done an overwhelmingly successful job at doing, is that love is all about feelings and emotions. No. <laughs> okay? 
I'm going to tell you something. Love, will, true love will bring emotion. Mm -hmm. But love is first and foremost a choice that you make. Yes. It's a choice. If it was an emotion, if it had an emotion of, on a feeling, and based on, how could Jesus possibly say, love your enemies? So understand, you don't have to like the people you love. Mm -hmm. But if you choose to love them, Feelings. I promise you, your feelings for them will change. That's right. And that's the truth. But it starts with a choice. It's not about emotion, okay? I I like her a lot. Alice and I, let me see. <laughs> Alice and I have been married for 49 years. 49 years, one month, three weeks, and one day. Yeah, because yeah. three weeks. And we like each other. Yeah. A lot. I have a, a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of emotions for her. Oh, you're such a cute kid. Okay. Um, but love is a real choice because there are times in any relationship, I don't know that, that too much, maybe on her part, she has to choose to love me. I mean, sometimes I can... No. 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 But you have to be able to choose. Do you honestly, can you honestly believe for a moment that Jesus Christ, the only, the only innocent man that ever lived, the only man who ever lived without sin, who stood before all of the power of the world when he stood before Pontius Pilate on trial. Pilate was the representative of Caesar, the power of the world. And Pontius Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. Crucify him. And he was taken, he was mocked, he was whipped. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They whipped the skin off his back. They nailed him to a cross. The only innocent man. The most torturous method of death that they could think of, the Romans could conceive of at the time. And he hung on that cross. Do you think that he felt like saying, I love you? But isn't that exactly what he said when he said to the Father, Father, forgive them? That's a choice. If you let your emotions and your feelings get in the way of the Holy Spirit, and that's what you're doing if you choose not to love somebody. Are you examining yourself? Are there people in your life that you that you feel so strongly about that you don't love them? Love is not the emotion. Love is the choice that you make to pray, Father, forgive them. That you forgive them. Because remember, let me go back for a moment to the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. How many of you here know the Our Father? That prayer. Mm -hmm. Do you pray it? It's certainly one of the most dangerous things that I've ever heard in my life. Because when you say, forgive us our debts, as we forgive others, are you not saying to God, forgive me like I forgot, forgave him? And if you choose not to forgive, God won't forgive you. This is serious stuff. This is not, this is not, we're not playing religion here. This is life and death. This is reality. This is the reality of the Spirit that will bring you to a place where you can, like Paul, walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Because there is nothing that a friend can do to you. There is nothing that an enemy can do to you that can cause you to stop loving them. Because it's not your love. For the love of God has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. It's not your love. There's no way we could do it. Either. Because if it was your love, you wouldn't be able to do it. You'd not be able to do that. But the love of God, the power of God, for nothing is impossible with God, will give you the power to look at that person that is most despicable to you, that is most hated by you in the natural, in the flesh. That's one of the deeds of the flesh. And you'll be able to look at them, and you'll be able to pray for them. And ask God's blessing upon them. Ask God's forgiveness on their behalf. And you know what? I don't know if that'll change that person one bit, but I promise you it'll change you. What is the thing, I, you, I, I don't remember what you call it when you say it, have words for a, you know, words for a, a word. When you have and words L for a word. L-O-V-E. It's oh. Lord, our victor, evermore. So when he, his love gives you the victory. And it will. It will. I mean, life is about choices. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's not what Joshua said as they started the journey. That's right. But as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. Isn't that what happened when God, in, in the time of great disobedience in his people, sent Elijah back into the land and he went up on Mount Carmel? And isn't that basically what he said? Choose. Choose. If God is God, 
Him. If, if Baal, you want to follow Baal, hey, go do it. But you're going to pay the price for doing it. It's always about a choice. Was it not a choice? By the way, I, I talked about the Our Father. If I said to you, do you know the Lord's Prayer? Would you say I've said yes? What's the Lord's Prayer? I'll tell you what the Lord's Prayer is. See, that was the, that's the church's prayer. Because Jesus came and said, I'll teach you. When you pray, pray like this. I'm going to tell you the Lord's Prayer right now. Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. I pray that I come to that place where that is my prayer. Because I have the mind of Christ. And Jesus dwells within me. Me in him and him in me. The Spirit of God. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I want that to be my prayer. Not my will, but thy will be done. It'll change our lives. And when it changes our lives, you want to know something? People will see the difference. They will notice God's redemptive work in your life. I got to tell you one more story. Just one more quick story. When I was going to the seminary, and this is going back into the 70s, mid, late 70s. Now, I, I had owned a small advertising agency in New York, and we just walked away from that, gave everything away, and went off to pray because of God's call in my life. But while I was going to the seminary, which is, you know, you don't go to, you don't do graduate work in a seminary every day, go maybe a couple of days a week. I took a job in a boatyard on the Hudson River in New York, and which is very, it's manual work. Very it manual. is very <laughs> manual work. And for whatever reason, I know you're looking at me now and you're thinking, what a nice guy. For whatever reason, the guy that owned, the little Italian man that owned this boatyard really took a disliking to me. Now, the interesting thing is I knew from the beginning that it, it wasn't me. It was what I represented because he knew I was going to the seminary. He knew that I had God's call in my life. And he just didn't like me. And it, I, I know that it was because of a problem he was having with God. So when I went to work there, he gave me every dirty job in that boatyard there was. If there was a bad job to be done, he would rush to me and he'd say, do this. And I had a, I had a great answer for him. I'd say, yes, sir. And I'd go do it. <coughs> and I did this. And he was really abusive. And I just kept, I just say, I put a smile on my face that says, you know, we'll do everything. Let's be cheerful about this. As unto the Lord. So I, everything he'd tell me to do, I'd go do. And one day, this was a, a, a boat yard where, you know, just private boats and private yachts. A group of fellows came up to me, and they were all boat owners in this boat yard. And one of them, they came to me, I guess there were three, maybe four guys. They came to me, and they said, why don't you just punch him in the nose and be done with it? That's, that's what they said to me. I mean, because his abuse of me was very yeah, public. Yes, I mean, yes. you know, it's, this isn't in hidden. This was in, in the boat yard. They said, why don't you just punch him in the nose and be done with it? So that gave me the opportunity to tell them why I didn't punch him in the nose and be done with it. Because of the love of God that had been poured into my heart. And because God said, you're to return good for evil. So I began to share this with them. And two or three of them got saved right there in that boatyard that day. They saw, now I'm not, I'm pleased, I'm not posting in this, because that love is not my love, it's his love in me. That work is not my work. My work is just to believe in Him. It's His works in me. But they saw the evidence of God's work in my life. They were drawn to that because they're not accustomed to that. You don't see that in the world. So when people see God's work in your life, they'll be drawn. You know, we do all this evangelism. I get distracted a lot. We get all this evangelism. We're going to go out. We're going to do this program. We're going to do that program. We're going to do this program. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles didn't go out and try and get anybody people came to find out what the commotion was all about. I'm telling you that when we start to walk in the power of the Spirit, when we start to walk in the true love of God, people will be drawn to us to find out what's going on. What's happening. What's happening. Because we have something that they don't have. Look at the divorce rate in the world today. That's love that's, not, that's failed. But you want to know something? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he says, Love never fails. So what they had was not true love. It wasn't God's love. But people are desperate for it. That's why there are so many love songs. That's why there are so many movies. That's why there are so many television shows. Because people are desperate for true love. And the only place that it can be found is in the work of the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave that gift to me. 
while I was yet a sinner. That's how we know what love is. I started by saying, you want to know what love is? It is God the Father giving his son Jesus Christ the thing that was most precious to him to save me, a sinner, who by definition hated him. That's what love is. We have the power. I don't, I don't believe we're going to change the world. I, I don't. Jesus is coming back to do this whole world in. It says that this present world is reserved for destruction by fire. Our job is not to save the world. But there's a Harry, a Deborah, there's a somebody out there that God can use us to change them, to, to bring them that love of God that can change their lives for all eternity. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit work in our lives. Amen. It has to be to everybody. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that for you? For even sinners love those who love them. So worldly people have love, but there's love, and then there's love. <laughs> God love never fails. That's what the word says, right? Worldly love fails over and over and over. Yes. The obvious difference that is to be seen in Jesus' statement above is about the ability to love those who do not love you. To love the unlovable. Mm. You have the power to do that. And to do it as he did. To love the unlovable, lovable, the lepers, the lame, the, the, all of those, right? Yeah. All those who were outcasts of the Judean society of Assign. Consider this. In the perilous last days, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy, second letter to Timothy, second Timothy chapter 3, he makes it clear that as the end grows close, a time Jesus said that most people's love would grow cold, the worldly kind of love will increase greatly. Lovers of self. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That worldly love will grow and grow and grow. But that love will fail them. Will never satisfy. It'll never satisfy, and it will fail them, and it will lead them to destruction. Whereas the love of God never fails and will lead you to eternal life. Amen. The world's love is selfish. Yes. That, that's what love is all about getting, that worldly love, about self-gratification. God's love is a gateway to all of the fruit, all of the gifts. If you don't have, this is like a chain, right? The, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have love, you don't have any of the others. And if you lose one, you know what? You're going to lose them all. They are dependent on each other going down the line. And you'll see that as we do this study. If you don't have love, you never have real joy. If you don't have real joy, you're never going to have peace. And it goes on and on and on. And that's so, so important because that's God's desire for us, to have that abundant, joy-filled life. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that as we do this study, as we get into this study deeper and deeper, Lord God, that your Spirit would that you sent to lead us into all truth we will make that truth more and more evident to us and more and more evident through us that we might be truly that light of the world and that salt of the earth that you can use to be glorified and change other people's lives and Father I just ask that in the precious name of your son Jesus Christ Amen and Amen you all come back now here God bless you so I cherish not all Thank you.